Okay, and I'm going to start the broadcast here. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. As you get settled in, please take a moment and introduce yourself in the chat. If you'll share who you are, where you're coming from, and if you're part of a congregation, the name of that congregation. Thanks for being here. All right, welcome everyone. Please introduce yourself in the chat as you get settled in. We'll get started here in just a moment. Okay. Well, we're at just about one past the hour, so we're going to get started here. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Tools and Resources for Climate Care. This is the first webinar in our Faithful Preparedness, Faithful Resilience series that we are co-hosting with SBP. Thanks for choosing to spend your afternoon or evening with us. My name is Avery Davis Lamb. I'm one of the co-executive directors at Creation Justice Ministries. The mission of Creation Justice Ministries is to educate, equip, and mobilize Christians and Christian institutions to protect, restore, and rightly share God's creation. Today's program in this webinar series is part of our Faithful Resilience Program, in which we are asking the question, how can our churches be hubs of climate resilience in our communities, helping our neighbors weather the physical, social, and spiritual storms of the climate crisis. Over the course of this series, which will last the year, we will be working with our partners at SBP to share faith-rooted, practical ways to prepare for climate disasters in your congregation and to build resilience alongside your community. Today, we're looking at some practical, practical tools to both discuss and build resilience in your community, We'll be looking at the Faithful Resilience Guide and the newly launched Faithful Resilience Story Map Collection. And we'll be hearing the story of a church building resilience through solar. Today is about seeking inspiration and seeking models for resilience through tools and through stories. So we hope that you'll leave this webinar with some ideas about how you can start the process of building climate resilience in your congregation or community. We have two guests today who I will introduce later. You'll see on the screen, Molly Johnson and Reverend Diana Wilcox. Let me share our roadmap for today. So after these introductory remarks and our opening prayer from Reverend Wilcox, I'll start us off by sharing some background information about faithful resilience. Molly Johnson will share about our new mapping tools for resilience, and we'll pass it over to Reverend Wilcox to share her story. We'll have time for Q&A at the end, so be sure to save your questions. And all in all, we'll aim to get you out of here at about 15 past the hour. So for me on the Eastern, Eastern time, that's around 7.15 p.m. A few housekeeping things to note. If you have not yet introduced yourself in the chat, please do so. I see most of you are selecting everyone when you do that. Thank you, make sure that goes to everyone so we see who's here in the Zoom room today. 
As I mentioned, we will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the presentations. I ask that you use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen for those questions instead of the chat. You'll see the chat is pretty lively now and will probably continue to be lively throughout the presentation. And it's easy to lose questions in there. So please put any questions in the Q&A function so that we can see those and address them. Also, you'll notice that the meeting is being recorded and uh, we will put this up on our YouTube channel and share it with all of you. And also you are welcome to share it with anyone else you would care to share it with, whether that's your community or your church. So with that, I'm pleased to pass it over to Reverend Wilcox to get us opened in prayer. Thank you for that. Let us pray. This is from uh, a list of creation prayers from the Church of England website. Creator, make us people who recognize, nurture, and act towards a more sustainable world for the benefit of all who draw life from this planet. Raise up campaigners who will speak out for wisdom, restraint, and compassion, and teach us to partner with you in protecting this precious world and the lives of our most vulnerable global neighbors. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. I'm now going to welcome Tessa Barron, who is co-hosting from SBP with us today. SBP will be join, joining us for this six-part webinar series, and I want to give Tessa an opportunity to introduce herself and welcome us from SBP. Great. Thanks, Avery. Hello, everyone. My name is Tessa Barron, and I am our Disaster Preparedness Program Associate at SVP. And I'm really glad to be here with everyone tonight. And thank you all so much for joining us and taking a little bit of time out of your evening to, um, to be with us for this next hour and 15 minutes. I'm just going to take a couple moments here to briefly introduce SVP for those of you that are joining us tonight that might be um, unfamiliar with us and um, what we do in our organization. We are a disaster recovery and resilience nonprofit, and we got our start just about two decades ago after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Our main mission at SVP is to shrink the time between disaster and recovery for our nation's most vulnerable citizens. It's important to note that in our early days, our operations focused solely on uh, rebuilding. And so, you know, our main mission there was to get folks back home into safe, sanitary and secure housing. But since then, in the past approximately two decades, we've really expanded our scope, and now we touch on the whole disaster cycle. So from preparedness, which again is where I'm coming from, our preparedness um, program, to response, to recovery, and of course, we're working towards building resilience in everything that we do. I'm going to go ahead, and after I pass it back over to Avery, I'm going to share our website link in the chat. If anyone is interested in learning more, I absolutely welcome you to check that out. And as we move along the webinar series throughout the year, we'll have a chance to dive in a little bit more and explain some more about our different programs and um, more that we do at SVP. But for now, I just want to take a moment to thank Avery and his team at Creation Justice Ministries. We are really excited to kick off the series tonight. We've got a great session to start off at the, at the entire series, and I'm looking forward to leading everyone through a session later on in the year. But again, thank you so much to Avery and your team, and again, for everyone joining us this evening, and I'll go ahead and pass it back over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Tessa. And we're so grateful for this partnership. The mission of SBP is so important, and it's really important as communities of faith that we're partnering with you all in recovery and resilience. Okay, so I'm going to get us started on the program for this evening. We're finally there, so I will share my screen. Um, and I'm gonna take just a few minutes to share a little bit of a background on faithful resilience. So as I shared earlier, we have a guiding question for our faithful resilience program at Creation Justice Ministries that it's really important that we ground ourselves in, both here and for the extent of this series. And that question is, how can churches be hubs of climate resilience in their communities, helping their neighbors weather the physical, spiritual, and social storms of the climate crisis? I think a shorter way to, to ask this question is, how are we faithful to our community in a time of climate change? 
I think the last couple of years, what we've seen is that climate change isn't just another social issue for the church to take up, but the ways the climate disasters, the slow violence and the rapid violence, like floods and fires, the ways that these disasters are affecting our communities and those we love strikes to the core of what it looks like for the church to be a faithful witness in the next centuries. What we're trying to do is better understand the church mission in a time of climate breakdown. Our churches are in the midst of this breakdown in both physical and in spiritual ways. So often these photos are the backdrops of our communities being affected by floods, being affected by fires. Often we are the only places of refuge in climate disasters, serving as shelters, cooling centers, food pantries, building the kind of preparedness and resilience that we need. And at other times our services provide for trauma. Our rituals provide space to make meaning in the face of the meaningless. Our community action helps cultivate hope in the midst of what can feel like hopelessness. So how do we respond? What do we need to do to respond? Well, we need to deepen our understanding of what is happening. What is climate change doing in our communities? What is happening now? And what do we understand might be happening in the future? And when we deepen our understanding, we also need to deepen the investigation into how our community can respond. What might we do to care for our community given the likelihood of future changes? At Creation Justice Ministries, we consider this the work of faithful resilience. Now, I want to take a moment as well and share a definition of the word resilience, because it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. And I want to make sure we're on the same page about what we mean when we say resilience. So what we mean is that resilience is climate change mitigation plus adaptation plus deep democracy. And what we mean by that is resilience has to include climate change mitigation, which means reducing our climate emissions as quickly and as substantially as possible, right? By reducing emissions, we will prevent future warming and we will protect our communities. Adaptation, which means making the changes in our communities, social, physical changes, spiritual changes that mean that we can still thrive in a climate changed world. And then deep democracy, which means changing those systemic issues, which have kept out those, those people who are on the front lines of climate change. The irony that the folks who are most affected by climate change are the ones who are most often left out of civic processes. So ensuring that we are solving those problems as we move forward. So an easy way that I like to think about this is that resilience is not about bouncing back from a disaster, but it's about bouncing forward toward a more just and equitable society. So what does this look like? Well, a few literal images of resilience here, and we'll get another one today from Reverend Wilcox, but maybe it looks like planting mangroves or planting trees in your own space or working with a community organization to do that, to address heat stress, to build resilience, those trees draw down carbon. Maybe it looks like rethinking rituals in our community to draw us closer with creation and closer with community. Or maybe it looks like organizing people to be prepared to go out with flood buckets whenever there's a flood in our community. What, it, what, what this looks like is it's, it's seeing what assets we have as faith communities and leveraging those to share with the community. It requires, requires seeing with clarity what are the gifts what are the charisms of our of our community, of our of our congregation, and understanding how those can address the climate cause needs around us? So, how does this align with what we know about building effective resilience? Well, I've done some digging into the academic literature around resilience. I've studied this stuff for a few years, um, so I want to share just a little bit about what I found. There's a wonderful article from Kais et al called Community Capitals as Community Resilience to Climate Change. And basically what they argue here, they found that resilience to climate change 
requires several levels of systems resilience. It requires hard systems resilience, right? That's the engineering. Uh, it's, it's the physical resilience, the things that we have to build for adaptation. Um, you know, in some communities, that's a seawall. In some communities, it's, it's, a, it's a natural shoreline, but it's ecological um, and it, it's engineering, this hard systems resilience. There's the mixed systems resilience, the social ecological um, resilience, the ways that we are interacting with nature, the ways that we are forming our organizations, the ways that we're forming governance. Some of this is the work of deep democracy. And then there's the soft systems resilience, caring for the psychological needs of community, caring for the economic justice needs of community, right? And so in other words, I like to see this as land, ritual, and people. And land, ritual, and people are three things that we have as faith communities. So where do we start as a congregation? Maybe we don't have all three of these, but maybe we have one, maybe we have two. So what's the process that we can take to better understand these gifts that we have and to build resilience? Well, one tool that I wanna share with you all today is the Faithful Resilience Guide that we've developed at Creation Justice Ministries. The Faithful Resilience Guide is, is it's a six part guide that takes you through these six different themes around building resilience. It's a guide that can be used as um, a, a Bible study for a green team um, or for a Sunday school class that you're doing, any sort of adult education class. Um, it's also a guide that could be the basis of a sermon series. If you are someone who preaches and you're wanting to build a series around what it means to be a resilient community, this could be a helpful guide to do that. For each of these themes, we ask these guiding questions. How can we change how we treat our land to care for our neighbors and build resilience? How can cre we create a just and beautiful world for our neighbors? How do we welcome our local and global neighbors? How can our worship and teaching encourage the building of a resilient community? And then for each of these, there's both a scriptural grounding, there's practical solutions, and there's discussion questions. So that's a brief intro into how we see faithful resilience at Creation Justice Ministries. This is a guide that's that's free and available at creationjustice.org slash resilience. I'll drop that link in the chat in just a second. And in just a moment, I'm going to pass it over to Molly Johnson, who has taken the faithful resilience guide and has done something really cool with it, which is make it into a story map, an interactive story map that you can use on the computer, that you can share um, with your community as a part of um, a Bible study or whatever else you're doing. So with that, I am pleased to introduce Molly Johnson. So Molly is uh, serving as the Environmental Justice GIS Mapping Consultant with Creation Justice Ministries. Molly also works as a community planner for the Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments. She holds a Master of Environmental Management from the Yale School of the Environment. Her past experiences include planning the National Adaptation Forum on Climate Change Adaptation in North America, advancing food sovereignty efforts while serving as a Tribal Resilience AmeriCorps VISTA at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College, and teaching strategies for living with the land while serving as a Jesuit volunteer at Sitka Conservation Society. Molly's passionate about approaches that advance environmental and climate justice and encourage healthy communities. Molly. Over to you. Thank you, Avery. Let's get set up here. Oh. So, it moved on me. Okay, so I'm really grateful to be here and thank you, Avery, um, for having me. It's an honor to speak with you all today. As Avery mentioned, uh, I'm Molly. I work um, as the GIS consultant with Creation Justice Ministries, and I'm happy to introduce the Faithful Resilience Collection, um, a collection of ArcGIS story maps that we've created based off of the guide that um, Avery just introduced to you all. So really, um, in terms of the collection itself, our key goal is to encourage congregations to take climate action rooted in 
environmental, and climate justice through the support of GIS map visualizations and engagement with other resources. Um, and Avery will be uh, sharing the link with you all in the chat there so you can um, peruse as you would like as I'm talking. Before I go any further into the tool, I wanted to talk a little bit about limitations of GIS and uh, reground us in what brings us here together today. So um, as you likely know, because you're here today, creation is stress and suffering. It's been colonized, divided, displaced, privatized, subjugated, and segregated. And um, many and some of these uh, systems that we're, we've engaged in have even been justified through improper applications of Christianity. And so really in order to move forward um, be, through from this suffering um, at which I see climate change as a symptom of is to move forward in a lens of healing. And so how does this relate to GIS? Well, GIS suffers from the same potential sins as the rest of us. Um, and so really when you use a tool like GIS, you want to be using it with intention and you want to be using it with the mindset of connectivity, of healing, of growing relationships. Um, and so be critical of the data that you see. And I say this for our tool, but also for when you engage with other climate tools or other tools um, you might be using for climate resilience planning in your community, because um, in the past maps have been used in ways that have hurt people and have hurt communities and the earth. So uh, we just wanna acknowledge that and, and really encourage you to, you know, after using our tool, go out, walk the grounds of your church, uh, get to know your neighbors if you don't already engage with them and really um, think about it as a way of building connection um, and always ground truth, which is just checking, fact checking what you're identifying along the way. So with our tool, um, the project methods that we use that relate to what I'm talking about here is we wanted to focus on a tool that could be um, really communicative, um, focused on you all, the users, um, and transparent with the data. So um, I'll show you more, but as you're going through, you should be able to know the data that you're looking at and what it means. and. Um, if there's weird phrases that you're not familiar with, hopefully we have the description to go along with it. Um, and with that, especially because we have an amazing community through Creation Justice Ministries, um, we really wanted to center that. And so you'll see throughout the tool that we highlight different stories of um, congregations who've engaged in climate resilience work. And we really wanna lift up and celebrate the work that's being done. So um, in line with the, the guide that Avery shared, we have six story maps available um, and it goes through different elements. And so the first story map really engages um, with getting you connected to um, the land, the, the ancestral lands that you're congregation resides on, we highlight the native land map um, that you can identify the indigenous peoples that um, whose homes, ancestral homes are on your the land your church resides, and also the watershed, the, um, the ecosystems where your land is. So you can get to um, better familiar with the land. We also then go into the social and physical impacts of climate change. So you can be thinking about um, both and how it's impacting your uh, faith community. And that's in the Fierce Urgency of Now tool. And the tools continue on. I won't go into all of them. Um, I'll let you do that yourself. But um, we have four other uh, great story maps as well. But I thought what would be useful today is to really give you some tips about engaging with the tool. So um, 
Here is an example of our physical impacts um, web application that is a map that uh, is within the story map that you'll find. And so you can see, I want to have, here we go. Um, I have arrows on here, so hopefully you can follow the red arrows, but you can see one of the uh, my favorite features, I have a lot of features I like, but on here is that you can see the location tool. So you can enter the address of your faith community or maybe even your home address, whatever you want. Um, and you can zoom in to get a better idea of how different climate impacts are affecting your community. And then you also, once you're zoomed in, you can use these um, zooming in and out feature so you can navigate it that way. You'll see over in the lower left corner of my screen is the three lines. And that um, you'll see throughout our tools is just uh, ArcGIS's symbol for a legend. So when you click on that, you'll be able to see these sorts of boxes that give you some insight into what are the symbols you're seeing on your screen. Um, and you can scroll through there and get a better idea of what it really means. And then another one of my favorite features are these information icons. And so if you're looking at this and you're wondering, what is this telling me? We have um, these descriptions through the information icons that will then give you a good uh, description of the data that we used and also what it means. Um, I didn't put it on here, but uh, if you click on uh, in the map itself, you'll um, be able to see. So in addition to that, I wanted to give you an example of what happens when you click on the map itself. And so um, here you'll see an example from Maryland. I zoomed in to uh, this area and I want to see um, a, more about the Shortage Wharf fire. So I clicked on that fire, you'll see on the lower left, and it gives you some insight into um, the data. And this is from the Office of Wildland Fire from the Department of Interior. So the fortunate thing about the wildfire map is that it live updates um, based off of their data set. Um, and so, but this is common throughout our map. So you'll see these little black pop-ups and that gives you more details. Now, if you want to click on a congregation, I clicked on St. Paul's Episcopal Church. So it gives you just an idea of how you can navigate the tool. So what I wanted to do is show you a live version of this. So bear with me if, as I switch screens. Um, and if you can't see, somebody just let me know <laughs> as I switch over. Okay, so here you can see I'm in- the... Hey Molly, we're still looking at your PowerPoint. Okay, thank you for telling me. Yep. <laughs> um, here we go. All right, better? Okay, yep, there it is, thanks. Great. So what I wanted to do was actually use Reverend Wilcox Church as an example um, in our maps. So here is our Fierce Urgency of Now Social Impacts uh, application. So what I'm going to do is type the address of her church in the location. I think you char uh, typed Avery oh. in the avenue. That's good. We have Avery on the call. <laughs> Avery on the mind here. Okay, oh, so... <laughs> Here we go. So it zoomed right in. You can see if I click here, Christ Episcopal Church. And what I'll do is zoom out a little bit. So this tool, if you're wondering, and it's let me just move this. Okay. Um, so this tool it highlights the climate and economic justice screening tool data. Um, and if you want to learn more, you can click on this information icon. Um, I won't read everything here, but one of the features about this specific data is that it's been used in um, the implementation of 
the Federal Justice 40 initiative. So this might be something really helpful for you if you are applying for grants um, that could be um, using Justice 40 funds. So we want to see how close is um, Reverend Wilcox Church to a um, what's considered a disadvantaged tract in the CGES um, data. And I will just say that uh, that's their determination. So um, I'm not the one to decide that. Um, but you can see that relatively close is the this tract here. Um, this considered disadvantage, and then nearby, um, more south, are also some disadvantage um, tracks. And then if we wanted to know a little bit more about the tract that Reverend Wilcox's church is in, there are the, you can click on the tract here and scroll down. And this is what I was giving an example of the, uh, the codes that can maybe be a little confusing. So in the information section, you can go through and um, you can look at the code and then here's a description available. Okay. So then I want to move over to looking at a physical impact um, near Reverend Wilcox's church. So again, I'll type in, I know I'm close, but. Go. You can see here is her church. And this um, map talks about heat severity. So you can see that very close by, communities are experiencing on average higher temperatures. Um, and this data comes from the Trust for Public Land. Um, so I think I just wanted to give that background because I think Reverend Wilcox will be talking more about that. Um, but I guess I just have a couple more things I wanted to share about the maps. So I'll switch back to my PowerPoint. Here we go. So one other map that we have, if this is separate from the Faithful Resilience Collection, is the Climate Resilience churches map. And fortunately, this is how I was able to uh, first meet Reverend Wilcox, because she submitted um, some of the work that they had done about climate resilience to Creation Justice Ministries to get her church put onto this map. Um, so I just wanted to, I guess, maybe make a plug. Um, we love to highlight our communities that are doing this work. I believe, um, like I was talking before about it being really community centric, is that it's a way for us to encourage each other, um, to inspire ideas, to build social resilience and connectivity across um, all of our communities. And so if you do have a project um, that you are planning or that you're implementing, um, Avery will be entering that link to a survey, uh, not a survey, sorry, to a Google form where you can give us some information about your project and we'll reach out to you so that you can add yours to the map. Of course, now we'll have to make a 2024 version too. But um, yeah, that's all that I have uh, for you all today. And I look forward to the Q&A. Uh, but first, I'll pass it back to Avery. Great, thank you so much, Molly. Thanks for all your work developing this tool. Um, just so so effective at bringing together data that exists from the federal government, data from congregations, and I'm excited for us to talk a little bit more later about how we can use this to be faithful and responsive to what's going on in our communities. Speaking of that, I'm gonna transition over to Reverend Diana Wilcox. Reverend Diana L. Wilcox is the rector of Christ Church in Bloomfield um, in the Episcopal Diocese of Newark, which is part of the Anglican Communion. Prior to entering the priesthood, Diana had 20 years of business experience working with large multinational 
corporations. And she now serves on a number of church leadership positions, including the Committee on Corporate Social Responsibility, CCSR, for the Episcopal Church, a very cool and important committee, which is responsible for researching the social responsibility records of corporations, especially those whose stock is held in the Episcopal Church portfolios, and then recommending appropriate courses of action. CCSR is also responsible for developing shareholder resolutions on social justice issues to be submitted to companies in which the church invests its funds. Reverend Wilcox serves on CCSR's Mining and Fossil Fuel Subcommittee with a focus on indigenous rights and deep sea mining. Reverend Wilcox received her Master of Divinity from Drew University, and she is a lecturer in business classes at Montclair State University. Diana, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you. And I've, I've just got to say the presentation by Molly, just went, just in the short time I've been working with uh, these folks, I, I realized just how little we have actually done and how much more is possible. So I'm, I'm just excited to, about this new collaboration. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully everybody will be able to, to see that. Um, everybody seeing that? Good. Uh, so I received this information about this resource kit, this toolkit that was being created as Molly just went through. And I was very excited about it because we had just uh, completed uh, a large solar installation on our expansive um, church facility. Uh, but just to, to step through, you know, I'll, I'll go through who we are and why this was important to us. And uh, the scale of the project and how a, a church, my church, wiped out financially by the pandemic could, could do this, um, the benefits that we see, financial and creation care, and the next steps for community resilience. Uh, as, as probably everyone's aware, uh, New Jersey um, perhaps isn't always thought of when, when we think of climate change disasters, but of course with Superstorm Sandy and uh, recently, Ida and others, um, we have been impacted tremendously. And I'm, I'm just going to um, show you this little clip. This was taken outside the doors of my church. So as you can see, the water was coming up out of the, the local creek there, and uh, that was early on. It got higher and higher, of course, and uh, uh, and so the, it, it is something that impacts our community. And as the maps noted, we are next to, um, we're, we're actually Christ Church in Bloomfield and Glen Ridge. Bloomfield uh, is the, this area in Essex County is between very, substantially wealthy uh, areas and also ex a substantially poor community. So we kind of sit right in the middle uh, of this. So a little bit more about us, just so you get an understanding of, of, of our background with, with creation care. We, first of all, we were founded in 1858. So, um, and we, we have a very large stone structure that has its, its own uh, historical uh, challenges when it comes to uh, what we can and can't do with it. Uh, we have over the years done what many of you I'm sure have done, uh, LED light replacement, liturgy, uh, leveraging creation prayers on, on a regular basis in liturgy. We've engaged the youth in uh, climate justice projects like the pictures you see here with the trash art so that you know, we had people bring in the things they were throwing into, going to be putting in the trash, and we created art out of it and kept it on display in the in the church for people to be aware of everything we toss out. This over here, this 10th station of the cross, we, we do a station to the cross in community where we talk about the ways in which we have crucified Christ today, and... Um, then we nail physically nail that particular thing to to the to a cross and the tenth station is about creation and the ways in which we have um, harmed it 
and of course some other things like letter writing and so on. So this is something that's been uh, up front in our, our heart and minds. This is just to give you an idea of the size of the of the um, facility. Uh, th this is the interior of the church itself, which is uh, located. I'm just going to move this so I can see what I'm doing here, um, which is located here in this photo. Uh, and then we have a choir room here. And then these are this, the parish hall, which is the size of a gym. And it goes all the way back um, uh, with um, classrooms for our nursery school. This building over here in the center um, is a church offices and nursery school. And over to the left, we have a playground and the caretaker's apartment and the um, the nursery school. So it's a number of, it's a very large facility. Uh, and so on the next, the next slide, I'm gonna, this will show you an overview taken by an architect who's in a member of our parish of the installation. Uh, solar installation itself. And one of the things you're going to see is uh, a white rubberized roof. And that was because the solar installer told us that that part of the roof only had about five to six years on it. And we really needed to do something. Otherwise, you we were going to end up in a situation of having to take the panels off, repair the roof and so on. And we chose to do this, which extended the life uh, of the roof for 15 to 20 years. Uh, but it also had a couple of other effects, as you'll see in this video. So the, the drone is going up over the church itself. That's in a historical property with, with slate. We could have done this. It would have been a lot more difficult, and we wouldn't have gotten as much value out of it. Then you'll see that the, the white rubberized coating uh, and all of the solar panels, and we also have solar panels on the building near the playground. We ended up with a reduced heat island effect because of the, the light reflects off of that white uh, on this 60 kilowatt solar array. Um, and we also ended up with increased natural light within the parish hall itself because that we don't have a, bl a black roof there. Uh, significantly reduced energy costs, of course, um, on this and a 400 amp electrical panel. So it's a large installation um, that was was put together Sorry. Now we were like a lot of parishes wiped out in the pandemic financially. Uh, we had we were a success story beforehand, almost closing in 2015, and had and ending up um, uh, by 2019 uh, with a growing a, a good endowment, a growing parish. Things were looking really great, but unfortunately, the nursery school is one of our principal income streams and had to close down. So, how possibly could could a church that is um, struggling financially be able to do that? And it's, well, it's because we didn't do it alone. This was something that that was in, done in partnership. So the the partners in this were, of course, our church, the Diocese of Newark, which is our adjudicatory. Um, and, the, and the things I'm going to be talking about while they're Episcopal related, those of you who are part of other adjudicatories, uh, the Lutheran Church, Presbyterian, and so on, might be able to do something very similar and have similar partners. And also, if you're not, if you're a um, uh, uh, community that that does not have uh, a larger group behind you, you may be able to pair off with uh, business partners. Uh, so there, and then there's also there an investor um, who was gaining some of the tax credits, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, so. Performance solar, it doesn't really matter. It could be whoever your installer is, but that's who our installer and operator was. Uh, again, we had this investor who got the government, there's uh, government programs out there which give you money based on the amount of kilowatt uh, power you you produce. They get got those uh, SREX or TREX, um, and they'll be getting the profit from those for the next five years. So they invested 20% of the cost the Episcopal Church Building Fund lent the other 80% uh, of the cost. And this is not just for our parish. There were a total, I believe, of 24 parishes across the diocese that did this. Um, and so this was a rather large uh, scale project all across northern New Jersey. Um, and then the diocese in Newark uh, acted as an intermediary, uh, making sure that uh, loan payments go up to Episcopal Church Building Fund and that the churches are supplied at no out-of-pocket cost 
uh, this solar. Um, just briefly, you can Google S-Rex and T-Rex, um, but uh, you get, it, right now, the locked-in rate was $152 per megawatt of power, which can be quite profitable for someone who's able to invest and then get that money back. And I have a financial sheet that'll show you some of that benefit. Um, and it kind of works like this. Uh, the, the Episcopal Church Building Fund over here on the left uh, lent 80% of the money. The diocese takes the loan, purchases the solar equipment. The tax equity partner contributes the other 20% and gets the tax credits. And the installer does what installers do, right? Installs and maintains the system. First five years, um, every, these folks are... Um, getting back some of that money the tax equity part the installer it, we're getting power of course and our power our loan cost for to the diocese is less than we used to spend in power so we're we're making uh we're we're gaining in expense reduction um the principal is then um there's uh, loan payments made from the churches to the diocese and then the diocese is in turn making loan payments back to a fiscal church building fund. Now, there's a new um, Inflation Reduction Act tax plan that now makes it possible that for you to structure this differently. Pro when we did this, the um, the non nonprofits couldn't collect the tax benefits. So this tax equity partner can actually be the church itself if they have the ability to um, to invest. Five to twenty years, that in, that person, the the T Rex, are now going directly to the diocese, and they are passing that directly on to us. So we end up getting income as well. Loans are still being paid, and finally, after twenty years, and this is a picture of me with some of the inverters up on the roof. Um, uh, uh, after twenty years, it we own the system and we pay the maintenance charges, and and but we get all the benefit for what's generated. And what that looks like, um, th this is a, a little crazy spreadsheet, um, but I'll go through it. The main things to look at is this was our initial annual utility cost of around $14,000. Uh, the SREX the individual is going to get is around $13,000. That doesn't make any difference to us right now. Uh, this is an estimated uh, operating and maintenance. But over here, our loan payments are 11,000. So we're a net 3,000 uh, on average. And that increases year in as the cost of energy goes up and our loan payments stay the same. Then in year five, because the SRECs are now going to the diocese and being sent directly to us, we're actually getting the, the money under the SREC column. So, so the, the uh, income to us is now at around 16,000 and that continues all the way into year 15 when the SREX stop and we still owe on the loan. So for the next five years, we're still doing well, but not as well as before. And after 20 years, we are really doing very well. And that's, of course, just the financial benefit. Um, oops. But the real benefits, the reason why we were so interested in this uh, is are the creation care benefits and our responsibilities as, as stewards of creation. This is very important to us. Um, this is one of the, the first examples in the Christian, uh, Jewish and Muslim scriptures in, in Genesis about being good stewards of all of creation. Um, and we serve as an example to the neighborhood. We are reducing our own footprint. Um, we are reducing stress on the grid. We're living into our call to be good stewards of God's creation. And we're lowering the cost of electric utilities for the church itself. And finally, there we're not done. <laughs> There's, in order to be uh, uh, to participate in community resilience, we recognize that um, that there's another couple of steps we have to do. So during Superstorm Sandy, when a lot of this area had no power for multiple weeks, uh, some churches were able to stay open either because they weren't affected by the power outage or they had some sort of back, pa battery backup. Right now, um, it, it it's important to know that when a power outage happens, the solar must be cut out as well. That's to protect the lines from, from excess power getting on the lines, which could be very dangerous. So 
how does this help us stay open and become a refuge center? Well, if we have battery backup systems that are also charged by those solar panels, then those battery backup systems, just like regular generators, become a, a way to sustain power and become a center of refuge. And that's something we are very interested in. The other thing that I was thinking about, and this is one of those things that all of the work with Molly has really kind of got me wondering about is how can we partner with those other 23 church installs across northern New Jersey to create create some sort of web of resilience, some sort of network of community power? Um, and I don't know what that looks like, but I'm pretty excited to find out. Uh, we would also are thinking about the, you know, installing an EV charging station. We have a number of apartment buildings around here. And if you've ever looked at electric vehicles, you know that if you live in an apartment building, it can sometimes be prohibitive to be able to um, get, go into um, an electric vehicle because there's no place to actually plug in at night. Um, and we're going to continue our work with Climate Justice Ministries, Green Faith, and other partners. And so that is my presentation about the, the uh, install that we did at our church. Excellent. Thank you so much, Reverend Wilcox, and thank you, Molly, for those presentations. We are going to transition into the Q&A now, so um, please take a few moments to get your thoughts together, any questions that you have, and drop those into the Q&A function. Um, I'm going to start us out with a question that I have. What I love about this, this, this session, this presentation, is that we're using GIS, we're using spreadsheets, we're using these things to care for our neighbors, right? That um, it's not super sexy to look at spreadsheets and to look at maps, and maybe not everyone here thought they'd be coming to, uh, you know, a ostensibly a theology presentation to look at maps and spreadsheets and Excel formulas, but I think that this right here is the work, right? This is the work of understanding what's happening in our communities and responding accordingly. So if this is where we start the work, my question for you all is how might you or how might we as the church use these data heavy tools, whether it's GIS or financial analysis for solar or solar power, how might we use these tools for Christian formation? How can we use these tools to be more loving and faithful? So let's start with you first, Molly, and then we'll go over to Diana. How could you imagine us using these tools? Yeah, definitely. So um, what came to mind immediately when you were saying that is, um, so the reason that we have the whole social impacts map is that we know that climate change, while it impacts everyone, it impacts uh, people disproportionately. And so, um, especially our low-income people and people of color. And so why we have uh, the tool with the climate and economic justice screening tool data, and also the um, US EPA EJ screen data, which I didn't get to show you all today, but um, is really to encourage people to consider their neighbors um, and where their congregation is. And I, I believe that most um, congregations likely already do in some way, you know, um, providing food to people or um, other things. But, you know, there's a lot of work to do in creation care with um, helping reduce heat island uh, with the roofs, like uh, Reverend Wilcox said, but also, you know, street trees, um, green infrastructure, people call it, you know, just ecological benefits um, in the area, um, providing green space to people. So I think that um, there's a lot of ways that uh, the tools, the GIS tools can help us to identify uh, who may be missing from our community conversations already um, and encourage us to engage with people who, um, yeah who should be engaged. So that's my immediate answer. 
And Diane, over to you. What would you say? Um, could you? I'm sorry, I was looking at the questions in the Q and A. Could you repeat what? You oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So how you know how could we use? Let, let's take Mo the map that Molly shared, for example. How could you imagine using this for Christian form formation in your church? How could we use these data heavy tools to um, better to be more faithful and to to be better Christians, really? Right. And for, as a former IT person, I, I, I have to tell you, this stuff does interest me a lot, um, but I am a, a kind of a nerdy geek gal. Um, so one of the things that I that I particularly liked was that in, in being able to drill down, um, and you get this with uh, Google World and all sorts of things like that, being able to drill down and see the, the heat maps, um, which are, are sometimes it's hard for people to understand. Uh, People are either auditory or visual, but visual is 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 something that really has an impact um, when people can, if you tell them that there, there's increased heat, if you tell them that there is increased wildfire activity, okay, that's fine. But when you actually show their place on a map with nearby um, areas where that are being impacted, um, that makes a difference. It, it it personalizes it. You know, I mean, I'm actually sitting here in the church. So when you drill down and I'm like, I'm here, um, I'm I'm surrounded by those things. And, and that's what, what really needs to happen is the generalized view of things is very hard for, for folks, but give them concrete examples, examples that are next to them in their community. And it makes all the difference in the world. Um, and the other thing the map does that I think is really important is it shows well, if those people are doing that particular thing, I wonder how they did it. I can reach out to them. I can certainly Google their their contact information and go find out how'd you do that. You know, what or um what are some of the things that we can then that we can partner with together? You know, I see you did that. Can can I do that? Can you help me figure out how to do that? Um, so uh I think that, that those maps really help with that. Yeah, and and thanks for highlighting the the specific the particularity of place. You know, I think we can often forget in talking about climate conversations that climate impacts are extremely localized. Yes, generally there are more wildfires. Generally there are more floods. Generally it's hotter. But when you look at heat maps or at air quality maps, it varies block by block, really. And so to have high resolution data that we can see in the map and then really better understand our community, like you're saying, Reverend Wilcox, I think that that can be really transformative for how we understand our place. Okay. Um, Reverend Wilcox, there are, are a few questions coming in about the solar process. So I'm going to group some of these together for you for the next question. Um, just generally any tips that you have Sure. Or congregations looking to go through the process, and then a, a couple specific questions as well. I think maybe you saw them, but one: Did you think about working with other parishes to get a a discounted rate on solar from the developer? And then, how long did the process take? And who, where were some of the places that you looked to find out how to do it? Well, the process went very quickly. We were actually contacted by the diocese, so that it started before we even knew it. They had flown drones over every single parish in in uh, the diocese in Newark. Uh, and the Episcopal Church Building Fund um, has um, a program that the diocese had connected with and suggested we make this happen. Then the solar installer could look and say, okay, this is what the, the of all the parishes, these are the ones we think that could benefit from this. Then they actually, uh, the financial uh, guy in the diocese, the CFO, put together individualized spreadsheet. So that spreadsheet, the financial view, I did not create that. That came from the diocese that said, this is the financial benefit to you. Um, and lastly, because it didn't cost us any money out of pocket, you know, so many, so many churches and other houses of worship are struggling right now. Uh, we want to do the right thing, but you know, we also want to repair the roof because it's, you know, raining on us on Sunday or right. We've got serious um, financial things that we have to focus on. So having an adjudicatory behind you that can help. But if you don't, there are other possibilities. 
take a look at that at that government program. You can be the SREC if you can put the money forward. If you can get someone to perhaps uh, invest in it for you, you can then get the the SRECs and the TRECs and provide that back. Uh, so if you are Episcopal and you're on this call, talk to your diocese and see if they can't work with Episcopal Church Building Fund. But if you're not, if you're part of an adjudicatory, show them what this is. This has happened, how this has worked. And if you're not uh, with any of those things, take a look at that program. Go, uh, you know, this presentation will be part of what they send out. I hope. Um, take a look at the. Um, Resilience Act, that the Government Act I was talking about, that says not-for-profits can now be the ones who get those SRECs. And it may be that you end up be, uh, profiting even though you have to put forward the money. And the solar provider, in, in the last answer, that was chosen for us um, because they, they needed to set up the entire program it, uh, before they presented it to the, to us. So we did not have a, a say in that, but they were they were good. Great, great. Thanks so much, Reverend Wilcox. Molly, over to you. There was a question about um, just where the data came from for the maps. Could you share a little bit about the kind of the process of pulling that data and what, you know, what's publicly available? What did we have to pull together? Yeah, so I was fortunate to come off of a base of Avery's work. Um, Avery had done a lot of work to you, <laughs> had done a lot of work to collect um, the congregational data from the different uh, denominations. So um, I think Avery did that in 2016. So we're going with that data in terms of the churches themselves, um, which is really helpful as a starting point. And I think um, is would have been a, a bigger challenge to gather um, independently. Um, but alongside that, um, we, so ArcGIS has a lot of, um, data in something called their living atlas. Um, so if you do have an account, um, you're able to, I, I think, um, I think, well, I think nonprofits can have a free account. I'm not sure about how uh, getting access to account. Uh, a lot of libraries also have access, I think, if uh, you wanted to do that yourself. But Basically, you can uh, pull data from different, a lot of federal resources, a lot of nonprofits, they'll put their data out there so that you can then apply it to your own map. So that was how uh, we got a lot of the different um, information um, that we've used. Great. Thanks, Molly. And I'll just say a word quickly about the, the congregational data. It is not exhaustive. So your church may not be on there. Um, it's a representative data set. Um, we're working on getting a more exhaustive set and hoping that we can do it and that it's not going to cost too much money because data is expensive. Um, but, you know, obviously there's a lot of possibilities for this tool. So we're working on growing it. Um, there's a question uh, for me in the Q&A that, that I'll address, um, which was uh, the question was you were emphasizing resilience um, and that it's both a physical and an emotional need and then asking about the Urban Sustainability Director Network Resilience Hubs and um, and what we think about the idea. So, and I'm I'm gonna throw this over to Molly after I answer, because I think you're probably familiar with these as well through the National Adaptation Forum. So um, my understanding of the Urban uh, Sustainability Directors Network Hubs is that they work with local governments to identify community centers, libraries, schools, et cetera, um, in municipalities that can serve as resilience hub hubs and resource those solar and battery backup, cooling stations, um, you know, meetup places, uh, whatever else, showers for displaced people. Um, it's, I, I think it's an amazing idea. And the ones that I'm most impressed with are the ones that have rich, thoughtful connections with faith communities. Some of them um, really are focused on uh, public buildings like libraries and public schools. But some of them, especially what I'm seeing in the city of Baltimore, is that they have identified that faith communities are already places of refuge and trusted places, especially for communities who might be suspicious of government. And so if they're able to cultivate a good relationship with the churches to offer them support, both technical support and, and funding, um, to do what they need to do to install solar and battery power, whatever it is, to become a resilience network, um, then, you know, I, I think that's extremely effective. 
The other piece of that is that as they're serving kind of technically addressing, um, you know, the physical needs of resilience, then the churches are also there to care for the physical and the emotional needs of the people who are there, you know, right? Um, having a trauma-informed approach to caring for people, using these pastoral care tools that our faith leaders have um, that librarians, you know, or, or maybe not all school teachers would have. So I think USDN is great. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see them work more with faith communities. Molly, anything that, that you want to say about those resilience hubs? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think you had a great response for that. But uh, what I will add is, I guess it just kind of like reminded me that for people who are considering implementing climate resilience in their community, there are many, many partners that you can seek out who are experts at the work. So um, don't feel alone as you're trying to maybe start your own resilience hub um, and or other other activities. Um, look look out for them. Reach out to us. We can connect you with people who are um, you know more specific into different types of resilience that you're interested in. Um, but definitely know you're not alone. Yeah. So I, I I noticed a comment in the chat that I wanted to pull out because I think it's really important. Um, Emily Skian uh, said, I feel like climate anxiety and trauma can be healed through spiritual formation and connection. And of course, we're talking about technical responses right now, but we know as people of faith that technical responses are not sufficient, that we also need to address the spiritual responses, our kinship with, with the world and with creation. Um, and, you know, heal and connect with each other, especially in the midst of, of climate change. So starting with you, Diana, how at, at your parish, how are you currently cultivating this kind of spiritual formation and connection in the midst of the climate crisis? Or maybe how are some ways that you hope to do this more? Um, well, I covered some of the ways we have been in the past in recognizing. Uh, I, I think one of the things that's very important is to recognize that this is a justice issue. You know, unfortunately, um, you know, it's people who are um, poor are not able to hire the attorneys to say not in my backyard. And uh, one of the things that struck me in my seminary was having to read a book um, that was talking about kids in the Bronx that carry bronchodilators in the same way that some kids carry packs of candy in their backpacks, um, you know, because of the Indian Points uh, facility. And so, um, that really uh, touched my heart. It, it, we have re a responsibility as stewards of creation, and and the one of the the ways that we can also uh, participate in responding and being good stewards is is something that you talked about a little bit with my background, and that is um, find out where for those of you who have endowments, for those of you who have or are part of dioceses or other adjudicatories that have money, make sure that your financial investments are not going uh, uh, to to an organization, a company, or or at least are engaged with the companies in which you invest to ensure that their practices are sustainable, that they are not engaging in um, uh, all sorts of justice issues, including uh, climate change uh, and, and uh, um, in terms of resistance to uh, the climate justice initiatives that you so you're on the one hand you're you're fighting over here and you're forming and you're, you're praying about this and on the other hand you're you make sure that your money is not actually going against the very thing that you're trying to um, lift up um, and so that's something to to also look at. Yeah, thanks, Diana. Okay, our final question. I'm going to point towards you, Molly, um, which just came in. It's a question about the connection with policy. And so how do you think that these story maps could be used to educate state legislators? Or I, I think it's applicable for, for federal policymakers as well on uh, proposed climate legislation. Yes, this is a, a really great question. So um, something that's been interesting is uh, sharing this with other people who work in the environmental field and hearing feedback of how exciting it is to have this data to show how faith communities are centers of resilience and how they, the potential for that. And I think that um, in my 
other, my day job, I guess, um, you know, we really do talk a lot about deep democracy, democracy, and how we can engage the public in um, the policy implementation side. So getting, uh, basically being able to show that that level of power that faith communities have um, to help address the climate crisis is very significant. And um, also, I guess just maybe I'm I'm stepping away from your question a little bit, but I, I do want to uh, encourage people who are still listening that um, you have just as much of a say and a right, I guess, to participate in those processes that are determining these outcomes for Earth at this time. So really um, using your voices and what you're learning in this work um, to demonstrate and and share publicly in the political processes that um, of what people should be doing, what you you want to see. Um, so I think I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wonderful. Thanks so much, Molly. That's all the time we have for questions. Um, so I want to invite everyone to please join me in thanking Molly and Reverend Wilcox emojis in the chat or clapping or whatever you have. Um, but thanks to both of you so much for these presentations. What a great way to launch this series. I'm so grateful for both of you. Thanks, Avery. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you to both of you. Two things I want to share before we close. Uh, the first is an invitation for all of you to register right now for the next webinar in the series, which is on culture of preparedness. It's all about the importance of creating a culture of preparedness at the individual level, the community level, and then also at the state and the federal levels. This one will be co-presented with SVP with someone from Tessa's team. So please go ahead and, and register for that one now if you're available. The second thing is we are always trying to improve these programs and be responsive to feedback. So if you would please take one minute, just a single minute, on your way out and fill out our one minute post presentation survey. This would help us evaluate what we're learning and give us feedback and of course, better prepare for the next webinars in the series. And to end, just thank you to all of you for taking the time to be with us here tonight, for investing um, your precious time in, in this extremely important issue to, you know, to think about how we can care for our communities. So hear this blessing. May you go forth as disciples of resilience, helping your communities weather the physical, social, and spiritual storms of the climate crisis. Thank you and blessings.